Here we go. Okay, we're live. Hi, everybody. Dr. Paul Nassif. Okay, let me get you out of the way. I can see you. Yep. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Hey, I have a quick question before we start this. Can you look at this right here? Is that correct? Okay, can you ask him that quietly? We're just checking to make sure that everything is working properly before we formally start this. Okay. Right here, can you tell me what I just said about yeah. this? He sees the zero viewer. He said the feed just came on. Zero zero. Yeah, is that correct or what? Okay. Now, if they wanted to tweet us anything live, how would I see that here? It's right here. I have polar for you. They use the hashtag Dr. Nasa QA. Oh, I love that. So. Okay, so you'll just tell me that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to start by the way of saying hi, this is Dr. Paul Massif, and this is our second Google Hangout. And what we did last time, which worked pretty well, we had a lot of people on board and they were asking us questions, or some of them sent us questions in advance. And let's start off by answering some Botox questions from Eileen from Albany, New York. Dr. Nassif, how much can Botox lift the brow? So that's a great question. So in general, the muscles right here pull down the eyebrow like this. So if you relax the muscles with Botox all around through here, the eyebrow can come up just like that. Now, I can't tell you exactly how many, but in general that we can have a good amount of elevation. It's called the Botox brow lift. The other area that can be elevated is right here, the middle part. So if we inject this area right here, the medial part of your eyebrow will go up just a little bit. Well, I'm looking by myself. I need some Botox. Look at those wrinkles. My goodness. That's, I hope that answers that question for Eileen. The next question is from Michael from Baltimore, Maryland. What percentage of patients experience drooping of the eyelid following treatment with Botox? Well, that's pretty rare. But basically, any time you do here or here, there's always that possibility that the Botox can drop into those muscles and cause what we call ptosis of the eyelid. So the eyelid can get a little sleepy, and that can last for two or three weeks. It happens very, very rare, unless you're going to someone who doesn't have a lot of experience. If sometimes you do it too low above the eyebrow, it will drop your eyebrow. So I hope that helps answer that. So you want to make sure that you go to an experienced injector, board-certified dermatologist, facial plastic surgeon such as myself, or a plastic surgeon. So that's those questions. Now we're going to answer some filler questions. Alan from, God, I have a hard time pronouncing this one. Pokes Keepsy? <laughs> no, New York. What happens if Juvederm is injected too superficially? You'll get something called a... Um, a Tyndall effect, which is basically you might see bubbling of the Juvederm or it will look blue underneath the skin. And by the way, Juvederm is not the product you want to use to inject the lower eyelids. It's great for around the lips because it's very soft. It's great for the marionette lines, great for the smile lines. It could even be great for the temples. Juvederm retains a little bit more water so you can have a little bit more swelling with it. Okay? So there's that. Brandon from Milwaukee, I have dark circles underneath my eyes. I have heard that filler can help with this. If I have filler injected in the area, what will, will the dark circles disappear? So let's take that. How about a dark shadow? If this area here is hollow, and as the light comes down and hits your eyeball, and then this is under, what's going to happen is, Basically, the eyeball sticks out. There'll be no light to that area, so that it will look darker. But if you lift your head up and the color goes away, then that's because it's hollow. So we can put it in fillers there, and I use a, um, a cannula to do that through a little small poke right through here. I fill the whole lower eyelid out. And 
I use Bellotero and Mestaline. These are the two best products to use in that area. However, if you have hyperpigmentation, actual pigmentation of the skin, fillers are not going to work. Filler will help if it's hollow. Okay. Mary from Reno, Nevada. How long will lumps or bumps last following a filler treatment? Now, really, you shouldn't have any lumps or bumps unless you have some swellings or a little bit of a clot, like a little hematoma or a bruise. But if you have it done improperly, then you can have lumps and bumps. However, you might want to massage it, but you should always ask your doctor first. Now, if you do have lumps and bumps and irregularities, usually you can have that reversed with something called vitrase, which is hyaluronidase, which dissolves hyaluronic acids. Okay? Susan from Makersfield. It has been nine months since my Juvederm treatment results are asymmetric. How can I resolve this? Well, first thing is you have to go back and, and let the doctor see it or go to a new doctor if you, for some reason, have trust issues with that doctor who did it. But first of all, usually most people are asymmetric when they start out with, and the doctor should point that out. And when you're asymmetric, when you start out with, you want to try to overcorrect the side that is a little less filled. And it's basically time to either have a little bit more filler on the other side, or if you really need to, you can dissolve the filler, as I just mentioned, with the vitrase. Usually, Juvederm can last anywhere up to a year and a half. So if it's something that's really bothering you, you either have to have it corrected or have it dissolved with the vitrase. Michelle from Fresno, California. What is the best filler to add volume to the cheeks? There's a great new filler called Voluma. It's from Allergan, the makers of Botox. And it comes in 1 cc syringes, and they have an FDA approval for two years. And that can be injected with a cannula. One little small poke, one little small poke. You go down on top of the bone, fill it. And you can have one or two cc's, depending how much you need, on each side. And I've used it already many times, and I love it. So I feel that Voluma is the, new, the best thing to use. But I've also used Radius, which is hydroxy calcium appetite. Um, I've used Restylane. I've used Perlane. I've used Juvederm. But Voluma, to me, seems that it gives it the best G-force or the best lifting power on the cheek, Voluma. And the average price is about $1,200 per syringe. Okay? All right. So that's questions about fillers. Facelift questions. Lisa, I have an elongated chin in addition to slightly sagging skin on the lower half of my face. My question to you would be, would you perform mental plasty in conjunction with a facelift? Or do I need two separate procedures? Now, when I hear the word elongated chin, let's talk about the chin for a minute. And by the way, most of the time you can do these simultaneously with a neck lift or a facelift. Do an incision here. If the actual skin is hanging from the chin, called a witch's chin, so if the skin here is hanging, we can make an incision through here and lift up that chin. So we can, we can correct that. Um, at the same point, if the chin is small, called microgenia, we need to put a chin implant, we can put it through the same incision. Now, I don't do chin reductions, and that's more of an oral surgeon. I think with the chin reduction, that might be a separate procedure. However, if we want to tighten up the muscle underneath the neck, you make everything through that same incision. You can do liposuction. You can put the platysmal muscle together called the platysmoplasty. You can lift up the chin or put a chin implant. Okay? So the answer, that's Lisa's answer, even though I don't know where Lisa's from. Arthur from Austin, Texas. How long will the results from a facelift last? Arthur, great question. You know, it really depends on the elasticity and the quality of the skin. And basically, if you have great tone for your skin, you drink a lot of fluid, you don't smoke, you're not in the sun a lot, the, your genes are good, seven to nine years. What I mean by that, though, is if I do this, how long is it going to stay elevated like this? It's not going to stay this much elevated at all because... In three months, it's going to drop a little bit, so expect about a 70% correction if we're doing a natural vertical lift. What are these? Live questions. Live questions? All these? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus, how am I going to answer all these questions? All right, we'll answer some of these in a minute then. 
Will you respond to him on Twitter if I answer him? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have, by the way, my Twitter team helping me in here. And what are we doing? We're doing Twitter, and what else are we doing live? Uh, Facebook, YouTube, all of them. Yeah, we're doing all that live. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So let me finish answering that. Average seven years, however, but you know, it's it's you're on a time, you're on a table aging, but we lift you up and put you back here, but you're still aging. So let's say it's seven years from me after doing a facelift on you. If I didn't do the facelift, expect what you have at the end of seven years will be double what you have. But let's say five to seven years for a touch up. Okay? Let's go to let me just mark where we stopped here. Uh, okay, let's answer these questions. And Kat, I don't know if you're listening to this. What inspired you to become a doctor? On my, you guys check this one on YouTube, what's on my, my website. But there's a whole video of me that says why I wanted to become a doctor. It's like a 10 minute video. But let me just give you the quick two, since we have so many questions, I'm going to make it really brief. We had, I think when I was a child, at the age of eight or nine, I used to go work in my uncle's office who was a general practitioner. That's when it started. Then I started doing more you know, volunteer work in high school. And my mom and sister always supported me to do this, and that's when it started. So it started for me very, very young. That's Kat. Uh, Mr. Davis, what is the weirdest surgery request you've had to decline? Uh, okay. I have numerous patients that will come on that want to look like celebrities or, or, or weird people, basically. And we don't do that. We don't do celebrity look-alike surgery. We want to make sure that you look normal. Or we've had patients come in that had, there possibly was some body dysmorphic disorder, and they wanted an over-resected, pinched nose, almost like a Michael, Michael Jackson type of a nose, and I refuse to do that. By the way, if you want to watch some of this crazy, even rejections or crazy, wild surgery, Make sure you tune in on the new TV show. It's called Botched. It's on E, and it will air in the fall, September. Cynthia, what is the most complicated procedure you've ever done? Uh, Cynthia, I'm really famous for these complex revision rhinoplasties, and I'll do 9, 10, 12-hour surgeries sometimes, and those are my most complicated surgeries of reconstructing, especially if... Uh, someone has had multiple rhinoplasties and everything is scarred in and I have to reconstruct the nose. And I do, God, I do so many of these hard, difficult surgeries. Every year it gets harder and harder with some of the patients that I'm seeing. Taylor, what is the longest you ever spent in surgery with someone? What were the procedures? Uh, okay, a full face rejuvenation, which would include facelift, um, rhinoplasty, Lower eyes, upper eyes, brow lift, mid face lift. It's pretty much everything I can do. And I rarely do that, but that was about a 12 or 13 hour surgery. But I have to make sure the patient is absolutely healthy before we do this. We do this. And we usually will get a cardiologist to help uh, make sure that the patient is 100% healthy before we do this procedure. Also, I've done revision rhinoplasties up to 10 hours. The Kiwi Dawn. That's kind of cool. Um, well, it looks like the questions keep coming. Oh, boy. Most extreme procedure you've ever... The most extreme procedure? I don't do extreme procedures because I, I like things that look natural. But, again, the most extreme before and afters have been some of my, some of my revision rhinoplasties. Especially now I go to the Middle East. I go to Saudi Arabia once every two months. And the noses that are complex out there from revisions or from something called leishmaniasis, they're intense. We're using rib, or we're using ear cartilage, we're using tissue from your scalp. These are very extreme. The goal is to take someone who has a nose that's been destroyed and make it look like a normal nose. Elise, what type of surgery do you perform most often? Rhinoplasty. 75% of my, of my practice is rhinoplasty, whether it's first time or the eighth time. That's the most common that I do. That's why one of my websites, Rhinoplasty Specialist, take a look at that, besides spaldingplasticsurgery.com, spalding without the U. Two websites. Teddy, unfortunately, I don't do stomach work, but I have great dyes that can give you a six-pack in the office. Uh, by the way, the office number for everyone who wants to know is 310-275-2467, or you can look at it on the website. Jacob, 
I want to prevent wrinkles on the outer corners of my eyes. What should I do? He's 23. Most likely, you know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of doing preventive Botox. But let's say me, for example. I need Botox now. You're young. Squinting will cause wrinkles. Smoking, poor Im, uh, improper hydration or not enough hydration. Being in the sun, all these, you know, in the genetics too, will cause wrinkles. If you get a little bit older, you might want to do a little bit of Botox to prevent the muscles from itching in. So when you smile and you start seeing some of these little wrinkles, you might want to try a little bit. But maybe for you, Jacob, you can wait, you know, till 26 or 27 or 32. Don't even know. Spencer, is there a procedure that's been especially popular in 2014? You know, all the face procedures that I do are always popular. Um, but what's becoming more popular is the vampire facial. And that's what, I don't know if there's any more, but I think that's it. Yeah. Vampire facial, where we do microneedling combined with platelet-rich plasma. And my esthetician, Aubrey, does that. And we actually take the skin, we put little small micro holes in it, do a little machine, which has little needles that come out of this round space. And you go, bop, 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 all the way across. Create the little micro holes which stimulate collagen formation. And then also we put the platelet-rich plasma, which have all the growth factors in it, on top of those little open wounds. That, to me, is something that I'm seeing more and more and more. In addition, you know, the fillers in the temples. Filling the temples is becoming more and more popular. And I'm interesting, I'm seeing a lot of patients that will have the left side of the temple is always more hollow than the right side of the temple. And we're still trying to figure out if that's why, because of the sun when you're driving or what. Okay, now, those are more? Okay, you want me to answer? I'll tell you what, let me answer, those are all more questions. Let me answer a few more face up, then we'll go back to the tours. Now, are you guys responding to them, or are they watching this? They're watching. Okay. Hope you guys are all watching this. Christine, Denver, Colorado, I just had filler one month ago. Do I have to wait until the filler dissolves before having a facelift? No. You can have a facelift now. The filler, especially if it's in the smile lines or marionette lines, you can still have a filler. And we can even dissolve it because most of them are hyaluronic acids if we need to. So no worries, Christine. Catherine, Phoenix, Arizona. What are the non-surgical alternatives to a facelift? You know, the ultrasound or the radio frequency type of lifts for the neck, such as um, Althera or something like that, there's all kinds of machines even thermage. So what you can do is you can heat up the skin and get a little bit of a lift, but it's not going to really get rid of, it's not going to do a lift like this and really soften this. It's going to help somewhat. Um, also, to prevent a facelift, you can do Botox where needed. You can do fillers where needed to make you look great, to kind of camouflage some of the sagging. The microneedling, what I just mentioned, is also great for that. So microneedling can, with these micro holes, can help stimulate collagen. Um, the number one thing I like to do is fill this area, hollowness, with fat or with filler. And I also put PRP in here. It's called a vampire facelift. I put filler to give you the automatic result, and then I will also inject platelet-rich plasma to slowly get your own collagen to build in that area. Nancy, Sarasota, Florida. Well, we got patients from everywhere. What is the best age to start thinking about a facelift? You know, in general, I probably would say the early 40s. You want to do a mini lift when your elasticity just is still in good uh, condition, but you're starting to droop a little bit, whether it's the neck here. And you can do isolated just cheek lifts, neck lifts, whatever you like. Isolated brow lifts, mid-face lifts, this part right through here. So that's what I would say. All right. Um, the more you know. Plastic surgery sense. Okay, so this, do you perform liquid facelifts? Yes. The liquid facelifts um, used to be uh, especially more with the uh, filler, the radius, the hydroxy calcium appetite. But to me, what a full liquid facelift is basically filler. So we can fill the 
we can go deep into the muscle, the temporalis muscle, and give you give you more of again that heart shaped face. Because as we age, this goes in. We can elevate the eyebrows and put filler. We can fill here, which will rejuvenate. We can fill the cheeks to give you a little bit of a lift when you fill. Fill the smile lines, fill the marionette lines, we can fill the lips, we can fill along the jawline if we have to. So we can use fillers everywhere, and that's a complete liquid facelift. Jake, I've had this line on my forehead. I hate you suggest Botox or tightening my forehead. If it's a line, Botox or Dysport or ZMM, these are all three different types. But that's like right now, if I look at me, I'm just looking down at the screen. I mean, I'd love to just kind of go like this. But these look, on this screen, they look really deep. But, oh, God, I wish I could just do that right now. But I need some Botox myself. Jake, hope that helps. Non-surgical face up that works. Uh, Brittany, well, it's more what I mentioned a few minutes ago about the, um, uh, you know, more about the uh, Thermage, uh, Althera. Those things can help somewhat. You're talking about maybe a 5% change, but if you have really hanging skin, it's not going to work. You need a lift. But the goal is to do incisions when you do a lift or, you know, whatever you're doing, whether it's the neck or the cheek or the mid face or the brow, you want to make sure your incisions are going to be impeccable. And that's why you want to check with other patients. You want to be able to speak to other patients on the phone to make sure that you know, you're in good hands. Tara. Oh, good day from Sydney. Oh, the Auslan, okay. How successful are your major surgical scar visions that have been caused by post-op infections? Ooh, that depends. Um, post-op infections, especially when I've seen them destroy the nose, uh, it depends really on the skin and the scar. And the doctor who trained me, Dr. Regan Thomas, was a scar revision specialist. And that's why we do these things called Z-plasties and running W-plasties. And so it really depends on where the scar is. So I invite you to call our office and maybe send us some photos. And by the way, we do Skype consults in addition to regular consultations. The office number, by the way, Brittany, is 310. Well, actually, this is for Tara. 275-2467. Uh, Kristen, mini facelift versus injectable fillers. It depends. Mini facelift. Depends on what you want to do with that. You know, if you want to just do a neck, it's just a neck lift. You want to do a little, just a little bit along the jawline, a little mini facelift. So that's going to lift up hanging skin. The liquid filler is going to give you volume, which makes you look young. And by the way, one thing I have is called the Beverly Hills facelift. It's a combination of fat grafting and surgery, which gives you the volume, using platelet-rich plasma to inject all across the face, especially in the surgical dissection, and a facelift. That's my Beverly Hills facelift doing all three. Tara asked another post-op staph infection with muscle loss and damage. Ooh, God. Sorry about that, but that must be in your leg or extremities, I assume. Um, you know, it really depends on what you have, and that's something that's a little bit beyond the scope of this Google Hangout. We have to really see what's going on with you, but since you live far away, um, I don't know any doctors in Australia, but you can always send us some photos and we can give you maybe a recommendation. Okay. All right, let me take a break here and answer now rhinoplasty question. Mark Miami, I am looking to travel two weeks after revision rhinoplasty. Is that okay? Can I increase the swelling? Yes. I like saying six weeks. Um, you can get a little bit of swelling, but I do have patients that fly everywhere after two, two weeks. I tell them to tape their nose, ice their nose, but automatically it will cause some swelling. But it will get better, it will go away. Ultrasound can also help with that, post-operative nasal ultrasound. Don, Boulder, Colorado, another one. Avid golfer, so am I, and swimmer. You have a rhinoplasty next week and want to know when I can resume the activities I enjoy. You know what, Don, every doctor is different, so I can't answer that for you because that doctor is going to have their own instructions for you. Me. I say, you know, anywhere exercise, I start starting around four weeks and I gradually increase it to six weeks. Betsy, Palm Springs, California. I like my nose from the front. Is it possible to change my profile by leaving the appearance from the front unchanged? Kind of, sort of. If we take down a hump, 
there'll be an open gap left in the bone. So we have to close that open roof deformity, and that's what it's called. So we have to bring the nasal bones together. So this area here will become a little bit more narrow. And sometimes when that becomes narrow, if the tip is really, really wide or bulbous, they won't look on track. So we usually will have to do the tip too. But there are patients that come in only to have the hump reduced, and it looks fine. As long as I examine to make sure that, especially, you know, um, you know, that uh, the swelling is not going to be too bad. Remember, with swelling, by the way, the thicker the skin, sometimes the more swelling you'll have, too. Uh, but, so in general, if this is smaller and the tip is really wide and the ala really, really wide, it will look a little bit off. We want to make sure we keep balance between your nose. Mike Hartford, Connecticut. I've had three rhinoplasties and the result is still not adequate. Okay, that's not good. My breathing is poor and the nose does not look good. How many is too many? Can I have a fourth? I would want this to be the last. You know, it really depends, Mike. It depends on what you're trying to achieve to make sure that you're realistic. Are you trying to do a reconstruction where we're building up the nose? I mean, what are we trying to do? And um, you also have to go to an experienced rhinoplasty specialist. And there are those doctors out here uh, across the country. And... I've done six or seven or eight surgeries, but really the question is, what are you doing? Are you going to the same doctor? Are you asking for something that's not realistic? Are you not expectations online with mine? So that'd be very important to find find out about that, Mike. Jessica, Portland, Oregon. If I need cartilage grafts for rhinoplasty, where would the cartilage be taken from? Great question, Jessica. First thing we look is the nasal septum. So in between here separates the right from the left side is cartilage. And if it hasn't been previously used, we're going to use that first. Second ear, if we don't need really strong cartilage, we'll use some ear cartilage, the incision behind the ear, and the ear becomes soft and just goes in a little bit. Just like that. If the biggest thing I use is rib, and I'll use that for a lot of patients for reconstruction where I need to have a lot of grafting. So if I don't feel like I have enough strong or the adequate amount of cartilage, I'm going to do a rib graft automatically. I don't use banked rib from a cadaver lab. I think it dissolves and go away. Blepharoplasty. Fred, Tucson, Arizona. Prominent under eye hollows. Is this something that needs to have surgery to fix? Or is there a non-surgical alternative? Hollow eyelids. I mean, hollow eyelids here. Filler, fat grafting, mid facelift, tear trough implants, which I don't do. So that's hopefully what I can you know, recommend for you. Fat repositioning, if you have the little fatty pockets here, we can keep the fat on a pedicle and eject it or just move it over into the hollowness here. Okay. We have, let's see another question. Just checking on something here. Okay, a couple more. I think we're answering Christian. What is the fastest way to get rid of hypertrophic scars besides vitamin and oil massages and microneedling? You know, hypertrophic scars, I have to tell you, sometimes we do surgery. Again, I, I you know, remove scars and I do scar revision procedures. That's one way if it's really hypertrophic and it's not working. Putting oils on it is not going to help if it's a scar. V-beam laser can help decrease the blood supply, uh, the blood supply to that scar, which will get it a little bit less red and maybe calm it down. So that's one of the thoughts. Um, the microneedling does work. Scar revision, removing the scar itself. Number one thing, prevent tension by when the doctor is closing something, they want no pressure or pull on the uh, skin. Um, so we want to make sure that everything goes smooth. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we all done? Okay, great. So I think we've answered, my goodness, a lot of questions. What time are we supposed to do this, Crystal? Okay, so we've been about 30 minutes. And I want to thank all of you. I think we're going to go ahead and do this. I think we're doing this one every month. And by the way, this is Chris Ferruzzi. Come in here, Chris. 
Chris is helping set this up, and he also does all of our post ops here. And this is our lovely team. Here, I'll see if I can switch this so you guys right. can see. <laughs> yeah, wait, come in, come in up. Like, uh, say hi, uh, introduce yourselves. Ryan Taylor. Nat, it's you, Nat. So, you know, just to let you know when we guys are about tweeting, you know, it's difficult. When I'm in surgery and stuff sometimes or in the weekend, sometimes I do get a little help. I give all my tweet. Obviously, you can see those photos I take and stuff. And, but I do have a little help sometimes because I can't sit and post all this stuff. So I do get some help, um, especially I'll send some interesting photos and... Actually, we should take a photo of all of us and tweet this. Actually, we should tw tweet. Take a photo of me now doing this Google uh, Hangout. That's kind of a cool little tweet, uh -huh. talking to everybody out here. So um, I enjoyed having you all here. I hope this helps. Remember, you have to make sure you calendar watching Botched on E. And I'm with another doctor who was on the Real Housewives of Orange County, Terry Debro. So uh, that would be kind of cool. It's a great show. A lot of hard cases. And, okay, good, I think. Oh, okay, we have one more. Visiting a qualified doctor. Let's a answer Britt, and because I think this is um, important. What are the questions to visit a qualified doctor? One, you know, you got to, you know, look at the reviews. Now, remember, you're always going to have some patients that are upset and give some answers, but overall, you want to make sure the overall reviews of the doctor are, are pretty good. I want to make sure they're board certified, and depending on what you're trying to do, if it's fillers, you can do any of the three, the dermatologist, facial plastics, or, or plastics. Um, surgery of the body, plastic surgeon. Surgery of the face, of course, I'm going to push you to board certified facial plastic surgeons. Uh, and um, obviously, the plastic surgeons do that too, but you want to make sure that they specialize in it. You also want to look to make sure they haven't been sanctioned by their medical board. Uh, you want to basically meet the office, talk to them, look at the website, see if you like the overall impression of the before and afters, and read about the doctor. I think all if you do all these things, you'll be safe. Okay. Thank you all, and hope to see you next month. Bye-bye.